So we've talked about point defects uh, and, and the variety that th those can take on. Then we've talked about line defects in particular dislocations. Um, now we want to extend and talk about planar defects, so two-dimensional defects, uh, uh, things like surfaces and interfaces. So let's begin and just we'll first start talking about surfaces and some of the uh, some of the discussion that we're going to have about uh, these will pertain to uh, uh, boundaries and interfaces as well. So I want to begin with the question, why are raindrops spherical? Um, what makes, and in fact, it don't have to be raindrops, what, why do in general, if you, if you have a, form a droplet, why does it tend to form a sphere? Um, well, let's, in the case of crystals, any sort of external surface is actually a form of a crystal defect. Um, and what's happening at that surface is that the coordination number of the atoms, remember the coordination number is how many nearest neighbors an atom has. So in the case of, let's say, FCC, for example, the coordination number is 12. So the optimally bonded atom in an FCC structure should have 12 nearest neighbors. Obviously, if that atom resides at the surface, that's not going to be the case. Uh, as a result, surface atoms typically have higher energy, and this gives rise to what we call a surface energy. Usually we denote the surface energy as gamma, and it's, it's some sort of an energy per unit surface area. So, so now we have a sphere with some radius r and some interface energy gamma. Okay, now I want to remind you of how we defined equilibrium. We said equilibrium is where the Gibbs free energy is a minimum. And now Materials, as you know, are going to seek to minimize their surface area relative to the volume of the material. Why? Because their surface, the, the surface itself, we just said, has an additional energy beyond the bulk. So um, we want to figure out how we can minimize the amount of surface that there is for any given volume of, of material. Okay, uh, I'm not going to. We're not going to prove it here, but the the minimum surface area for a given volume of material occurs when you have a sphere, right? Um, so the surface energy of that sphere could be given as gamma times 4 pi r squared, which is the surface area, for that volume of 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay, something else uh, is also relevant here, and that is that because materials seek to minimize their surface area, just the, for the same reason that they formed a droplet, right, they wanted to minimize their surface area per unit volume, what else might they be able to do? Well, Turns out the droplets want to grow to reduce the fraction of their atoms that are on the surface. How do we know that? Let's think about the surface energy per unit volume. So this is just now taking uh, the, the surface energy of the, of the droplet, dividing it by the volume, and you can see that we end up with this term 3 gamma over R. So if I want to reduce this quantity, I need to make R larger. That's the driving force for the growth, okay? So that's our uh, really our discussion on external surfaces. Coordination number is less than in bulk, which drives the energy up. Now that means that it's a it's a high energy uh, region, which we'd like to minimize thermodynamically. Okay. Let's move on to talk about interfaces and boundaries. So you can think of an interface, a material interface, as a subset of an external surface. Right. An external surface. Uh, is in contact with vacuum or air a material interface is just is is uh, the material touching another type of material so an example in this case would be let's say a metal matrix composite all right so uh, what I'm showing you here is just a uh, it looks like an SEM image yet this is your 100 micron scale bar this is a silicon carbide fiber uh, embedded in a titanium alloy matrix this is this is um, an existing example of uh, obviously material interfaces, right? As, as you expect, those interfaces are higher energy than either the, uh, than either the, the bulk of either material, rather. Okay, related to this material interface, there's also something called a phase boundary. And the phase boundary is the separation of two different phases of the same material. So let me give you an example. One type of steel microstructure that we're going to talk about in this class uh, in a few weeks is called perlite. Um, and perlite is comprised of alternating layers of alpha ferrite and iron, car uh, iron carbide or cementite. So what, what you should know, this is the structure. And you can see these grains right here, right? But 
you can also see that within each grain there's this sort of layered structure with alternating light and dark regions. The light region is alpha ferrite. Okay, that is iron with carbon. Okay. The dark region is cementite. It's also iron with carbon. So so the, the, we, we call this whole thing steel, but it's in this case, it's comprised of two different phases, and those boundaries constitute phase boundaries. And as you expect, at the boundary, those atoms are at higher energy states than they are within the bulk of their phase. Okay? Let's, let's move on and talk about grain boundaries. Grain boundaries uh, are just boundaries that separate two different crystal orientations. So the easiest way to see this is to just look in 2D. So here's our, here's our crystal structures. And you can see that there's this, let's just pick this line, for example, this line of atoms. And, and it clearly doesn't continue past this boundary. So if we were to draw that line, and we'll do the same thing here, right? You can see that, 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 um, that lattice or that uh, crystal structure does not proceed past that boundary, right? So, so this represents the boundary between them. As you can see, these atoms on the boundary aren't optimally bonded, right? So it's also going to be a higher in a higher energy state. In fact, then we look at where the this row of atoms exists now in the new grain, and you can I'm highlighting that with this green line, so you can just kind of get a sense for how far off the orientations are. And so grain boundaries are typically characterized by their angle of misalignment. Okay, so there's uh, the measure of the angle. If you have something like this top one where it's a large angle, typically we call these greater than 10 degrees. It's going to be called a high angle grain boundary. If we have something that's less than 10 degrees, we're going to usually call that a low angle grain boundary. Those aren't hard numbers. Those are just rough numbers. Okay, sometimes people will change that definition a little bit. Usually we are going to divide the low angle boundaries into uh, by the character of the boundary. So we often will call a, a tilt boundary one that's characterized by an array of edge dislocations and a twist boundary by an array of screw dislocations. I know we didn't spend uh, time talking too much about the difference between edge and screw dislocations. Don't panic. I'm not going to hold you accountable for that uh, for this class. But let's look at an example here. So uh, let's suppose this, this uh, square... Uh, array is our lattice structure and here's our dislocations there's three in this case and you can see that there there is a if this is the line of one crystal and this is the line of another there's a slight angle change between them for this low angle boundary right and the if if i were to stack up this is these are edge dislocations if i were to stack up an array of them like this uh, it's going to move the crystal rotate it slightly okay so uh, this let's call this distance of, the, of one square that's a Berger's vector shift and this the distance between them vertically is going to be the spacing and we can show that the angle of that boundary is is approximately related to the Berger's vector divided by that spacing okay uh, so as the spacing uh, um, increases the angle gets smaller as expected Okay, so that's that's pretty much all you need to know about grain boundaries. Remember that they're high energy or higher than the bulk. Um, and uh, um, again, I'm going to summarize uh, sort of features of all of these uh, planar defects uh, at the very end of this lecture. Uh, right now, I'm just trying to cover um, the types that we encounter in, in uh, crystal structures. Okay, another type, this is a, really a subset of what we just talked about, but we have what's called a twin boundary. And a twin boundary is, is this special subset of grain boundaries, and, and it's, it's the case where the atomic structure on one side is this the mirror image of the other, which is what I'm showing you in this picture, right? So it looks like if this dashed line, which is our what's called our twin boundary, if, we, if it was a mirror, it would, that's exactly what we would see from the other side, okay? The other thing that you should note about this boundary is that it doesn't look like the atoms are in disorder here, right? So, in fact, usually the twin boundaries are called coherent, right? And that means that the atoms on the boundary actually reside properly in their lattice structure, and those lattice structures just happen to match up along the boundary, right? Twin boundaries result when stack the stacking sequence of the planes is reversed. So, 
Let me give you an example in FCC. If we have an untwinned FCC material, then the stacking sequence is ABC, 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 right? Where A, B, and C are the different uh, plane locations, uh, you know, refer back to that uh, when we talked about the FCC crystal. If we twin that, it goes A, B, C, A, B, C, right? And then, right, as you can see, B could be connected to A or C. In this case, so we go from A, B, C, A, B, C. The next one normally would be an A, but it could be a B. So we connect it to the B and then we, we reverse the order. So now it's B, A, C, B, A, C, which is what you actually see up here, okay? In the EBSD, uh, that's electron backscatter diffraction, uh, twins appear as straight lines running across the grain, just like this, right? So you can see these very straight lines kind of going across. Here's some more up here. Those are examples of twin boundaries, okay? One more type of defect that's related to a twin boundary but it's distinct from is called a stacking fault. And all a stacking fault is, it's a single defect in the sequence of stacking. So I'm showing you this here again for the FCC. We go A, B, C, A, B, and then instead of C, we go back to A, but the crystal still repeats. So it's not a mere image, but at this sort of uh, pipe, that's the stacking fault, right? And it has a higher energy than, than if it were in the, the stacking sequence that it wanted. I'll also say that twins in general are going to be higher energy than the bulk. Even though they reside in a lattice location, they don't have the preferred stacking sequence. However, twins are going to be lower energy than, like, for example, your high angle grain boundaries, for example, because they're closer to where they should be. Okay? So now let's talk about what's the effect of all of these planar defects. Why do we care about them? How are we going to use them as we, as we talk about manufacturing of, uh, let's say, steel or aluminum alloys? Okay? So the first is that all 2D boundaries contain atoms that aren't optimally bonded. That's what, that's why they're a boundary. And those energies of those boundaries are going to be higher than in the bulk material. So there's always a driving force to reduce that uh, when possible. Okay. Uh, one thing that we'll talk about, uh, and you probably have noticed just in your own uh, experience, anything that has higher energy is going to lead to greater reactivity. So that means that atoms at the boundaries, whether it's at the surface or the grain boundaries, are going to bond more readily with impurities, which means that if you want to know where corrosion is going to happen the, the fastest, it's going to happen at your surfaces and your grain boundaries. Um, it's also going to allow higher rates of diffusion, which is why if you remember back to uh, our earlier lectures where I talked about uh, uh, trying to make single crystal gas turbine engine blades, um, the reason we do that is because uh, diffusion is a problem at high temperatures and high loads uh, in terms of allowing for creeping or the long-term deformation of this material. And if grain boundaries, for example, permit that deformation to happen uh, more quickly, it's, it's uh, beneficial to reduce the number or eliminate grain boundaries, which is why we use single crystals. Okay. This is important here. All 2D boundaries are going to increase the resistance to dislocation motion. So that means you should see an increase in yield strength, right? If you uh, increase the increase the density, the number of boundaries per unit volume, you should see an increase in your strength. Okay. Um, uh, this this is this is something that we're gonna we're gonna talk extensively about, and it's gonna govern a lot of the heat treatment in our materials, right? So. If I have a grain that is, if I, if I have 10 grains that are um, uh, one micron across versus one grain that's 10 microns across, I have a lot more dislocation barriers in the smaller grain material uh, because they're, because the dislocation has to, has to penetrate or is blocked by uh, all of those. So we're going to use 2D boundaries as a way to increase strength in our metals. Okay. Um, the other, the other thing I want to say is that, and I think I mentioned this with respect to the, the sort of the raindrop problem. In the case of metals at sufficiently high temperatures, and we'll have to define what sufficiently high means later, grains are going to grow. Uh, in response, why? To the driving force to reduce their grain boundary energy, right? For any given volume of material, the larger we make, um, let's, well, in this case, uh, we already showed that the larger the volume is, uh, the, the less percent of surface atoms there are, so it's a lower energy per unit volume. So if you have 50 grains in a material, for example, and you want to reduce the energy of that system, it would be better to have that as an entire single grain, 
right? It's the big, larger single grain, obviously, 50 times as large as the, the, the other grains. Um, and that, that's a driving force that we'll use uh, sometimes to, um, uh, in, in the course of our heat treatment of, of metals, okay? So just keep that in mind. I don't want to give a whole lecture on 3D volume defects because um, frequently they're, they're um, difficult to, to distinguish from just um, maybe macroscopic defects. So they don't maybe properly belong in the crystal defect section. But uh, they can be considered crystal defects. I'm just showing you a picture here of some types of defects. So you could have pores. So this, what you're looking at here is a, is a CMC, a ceramic matrix composite. It's, it's called a six, six composite. It's silicon carbide fibers surrounded by a boron nitride coating with a silicon nitride matrix. Okay. Uh, and so here you can see a pore. Uh, here's some cracking where some debonding has happened. That appears as a volume defect. So cracks are another option. And then you could just have inclusions sort of like we had uh, in this oxide region around the pore here. Okay. So the reason we're not going to spend too much time talking about these properly is because it's a little bit ambiguous as to whether it's really a defect or it's going to be considered as sort of a composite of two materials or if we have a material and a void. So the scale of the analysis here really matters. If I was modeling this particular material in this slide uh, at the microstructure level, then I'm going to model the voids individually. If I'm going to model it at a macroscopic level and smear everything together, I might want to figure out a, a different representation for the material that, that sort of includes the voids without explicitly modeling the voids. Um, but that's pretty much all that you need to know in this class, at least, about uh, defects in crystals and crystal structures. And what we want to talk about next is, um, is diffusion. And then we're going to combine this idea of diffusion and defects and talk about how to uh, we can we can actually control the properties of metals.